Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Jonas Carlson here and I'm uh, hosting Aubrey de Grey. And uh, we have a very interesting talk ahead of us. Uh, this talk is being recorded for a Google video and will be put up there for public consumption. Um, so um, please don't ask any um, Google confidential questions. Um, the name of the talk is Prospects for Extending Healthy Life and um, hopefully doing it a lot. Um, so Aubrey de Grey is um, Biomedical gerontologist based in Cambridge, UK, and is the chairman and science, uh, chief science officer of the Methusla uh, Foundation. So it's non charity, um, non profit charity, and they're combating the aging process. And um, I will let him himself introduce the rest of it. Um, here he is. Thanks very much, Jonas, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, before I start, I should say two things. First of all, if you want to ask questions and interrupt during the talk, that's perfectly fine. It doesn't bother me at all. I don't know what the convention is here, but from my point of view, that's okay. And the second thing is, I have been asked that when someone asks a question, whether it's during the talk or at the end, that I must repeat the question so that it gets on tape properly. And I'm going to forget. So, so everyone, if I, if I don't repeat the question, please remind me, even if you did hear it yourself. All right. Um, well, here I am, and I'm going to try and get through an awful lot of material in the next 45 minutes. Um, in fact, it's going to be pretty obvious pretty quickly that I'm only going to be able to scratch the surface of the stuff I work on. And that's really good news, because I'm going to be talking about technological uh, advances that I hope to see happen in the next few decades, and to have demonstrated in feasibility within, let's say, one decade in the laboratory. And stuff that is a decade away, even from proof of concept, of course, often doesn't happen. So the question is really, what can one do to, um, you know, to, to decide whether something is likely or is unlikely to happen in 10 years' time? And one big component of that is, how much detail do we already have with regard to the way that we're going to go about it? And as you will see, the amount of detail that there is in the plan that I'm going to be summarizing for you today is, well, you would need to have me back every day for a year to hear and to, to have me run out of things to tell you. So um, first of all, I thought I would just start with an advertisement. Um, I live in Cambridge in the UK, and every other year I run a conference which showcases all of the, well, as many as possible anyway, of the various um, strands of biology that I've brought together into the, um, the big plan that I have for defeating aging. Um, it happens this September, and any of you can come. I would be delighted. Um, Cambridge is a beautiful place to visit, and that's a good time of year to do it. And the uh, ambiance is very, is very conducive to learning a lot. The conference, um, it all happens in one place. You live and eat and hear the lectures in the same place. The alcohol is free every night, all night. Um, and so, so, it, uh, so yeah, please, please do come along. There's the website for you to have a look at. All right, so this is how I'm going to break down the next 45 minutes. First of all, I'm going to talk about something that I've been calling longevity escape velocity, which, well, as you can see, it, essentially it's a, it, it's a line of reasoning that is pretty obvious, actually, especially to people with an IT background, but, so I'll probably go through it quite quickly, um, but it gets me in an awful lot of trouble. And essentially, it's the main reason why I think that a lot of people alive today have a pretty damn good shot at living four-digit lifespans. Um, then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to be describing how I think we're going to do the first steps of that, giving people about 30 years of extra life, but in particular giving those 30 years to people who are already in middle age before we do anything to them. And then finally, I'm going to give a brief summary of the work of the foundation that I'm the chairman and chief science officer of, and not just what we're doing at the moment, which, to be perfectly honest, isn't actually very much yet, um, but also where we expect and hope to be over the next few years. So I'm going to start here. And this is the sort of statement that I tend to make in public, and an awful lot of my colleagues in, who work on the biology of aging wish I wouldn't. Um, it's a pretty straightforward and concrete numerical statement that the first person to live to 1,000 is probably less than 20 years younger than the first person to live to 150. Um, in case you didn't know, the um, 
oldest that anyone has ever lived so far is 122, a French lady named Jeanne Calment, who died about 10 years ago. Um, and to get to 150 is going to be very difficult. Um, but I shall try to persuade you over the next probably only five or 10 minutes in the first part of the talk that by the time we've done that, it'll all be starting to get rather easier. Um, in order to get going on this, I have to give you a brief definition of what aging is, because I know that um, a number of people here have probably got a little bit of biology um, expertise, but aging is something that even a lot of biologists don't really understand, even in very fundamental ways. Um, the first thing to know about aging is that we don't have genes for it. We have genes to defend against aging. And when different organisms, different species have different lifespans, that's because the long-lived organisms have better anti-aging genes, not because they have less good pro-aging genes. This is something that's been understood within gerontology for over 50 years now. Essentially, we can't have genes for aging because aging doesn't happen enough in the wild. Organisms just very rarely die of aging, and therefore there's no phenotype to have a genotype for. Um, now, mechanistically, what aging is, it's a side effect of being alive in the first place. Um, it's something you already know, obviously, but I thought I would set it out in, this term, in these terms. Metabolism has side effects, and these side effects build up during life, and eventually they're bad for us. They get in the way of metabolism and stop metabolism from being able to perform at full function, and that's what I'm calling pathology. Eventually, frailty and age-related diseases begin to emerge. And finally, I want to point out that pathology causes more pathology. In other words, um, things spiral out of control. The more the frailer you are, the more rapidly you get frailer still. Now, the one thing I want to highlight on here that seems a little bit um, innocuous, but it's very important that you understand for the rest of the talk, is my use of this word damage. I'm going to be using this word damage in this very precise way. You should consider these two middle lines here as being the definition of the term damage for the purpose of this talk. So. Damage I'm using to mean the set of intermediaries between metabolism and pathology, the set of molecular and cellular phenomena that occur during life ongoingly, that are laid down as changes in the body, starting from before we're born even, and that eventually start to cause decline in function, in other words, pathology. That's the way I'm going to be using the word damage. Now, if we bear in mind what I've showed you on the previous slide, we can conceptualize well, really four different ways of intervening in aging and postponing the age at which we become frail and pathology starts to emerge. Um, one of those ways is not depicted on this slide, and it's the way that you may have heard a little bit about. Um, it includes things like calorie restriction and um, drugs that, that, that trick the body into thinking that it's not getting enough food when in fact it is. Um, calorie restriction is a very interesting phenomenon that... Um, essentially causes organisms to hunker down and put more effort into postponing their own aging than into other things that organisms normally have to do, like reproduction. And uh, exactly what's going on there is you know, still controversial. There's a lot of work being done. I'm not going to talk about it today. Um, but the real reason why it's an exception is that there are genes for that sort of modulation of aging. It's just that there's only so much they can do. And it looks as though they can't do very much for long-lived organisms like humans. So the three other alternatives for postponing aging are depicted on this slide. Um, what I'm calling the geriatrics approach is basically pathology is beginning to emerge, and the idea is to slow down the rate at which damage causes this pathology, and pathology continues to accelerate. These arrows with the flat heads, that's a notation that comes from the genetic literature, and it means inhibits. So this is just saying that geriatricians are about trying to slow down the rate at which damage translates into pathology. And that's all very well, but because of what I told you a moment ago, that pathology is a downward spiral, it causes more pathology, and because the damage is continuing to accumulate, um, you're basically stuffed. You can only get this, keep this going for a short while before the problem of holding pathology back just um, overwhelms any technology that the geriatrician might be able to apply. So it's a losing battle. Now, the gerontology approach, as I'm calling it, says, well, OK, prevention is better than cure. Maybe let's dive in really at the beginning of this chain of events. Let's try and clean up metabolism and make it 
lay down this damage I'm talking about more slowly than it normally would. And that would, of course, have the beneficial effect of delaying the age at which the damage reaches a level that causes pathology. That's all very well, but there's one big, big problem with that. Because we don't have genes for aging, as I told you earlier, in order to clean up metabolism, we don't just have to switch off one or two pro-aging genes. We actually have to improve on evolution's extraordinarily sophisticated and elaborate mechanism for making us age as slowly as we do already. And that's a very tall order. Evolution is much, much, much cleverer than we are. And we do not understand metabolism very well at all yet. And it'll be a very long time before we understand it anything like well enough to be able to go in and tinker with it in the manner that an engineer might tinker with a car. Of course, the fact that it's very, very complicated is only part of the problem. The other problem is that we don't have the plans. Um, but basically, it's, a, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's just an idea that's well ahead of its time. Um, now, interestingly, those two approaches are really the only two that have been considered historically. And the major innovation that I think I can claim to have made in the field is to point out that there is a third approach, uh, what I'm calling here the engineering approach to postponing aging, which seems quite likely to be more feasible by virtue of avoiding both of the problems I just spoke about. The engineering approach says, well, okay, there's this damage I'm talking about. There are these intermediates, these gradually accumulating intermediates between metabolism and pathology that are, that are laid down as a side effect of being alive and that eventually cause pathology. Now that eventually part is very useful because what it means is that there's a threshold level of damage that we can put up with perfectly well. And if we can just go in and reasonably thoroughly repair that damage um, and thereby get rid of some of it or most of it, then we're buying time during which metabolism may lay down some more, but we can go in again and get rid of some more damage. And if we can do this well enough, then we end up postponing, perhaps indefinitely, the age at which pathology emerges by virtue of damage being too abundant for metabolism to cope with. And this has the advantage that it's sufficiently preemptive that it's not in the geriatrician's downward spiral. It doesn't allow pathology to emerge. But it's also sufficiently late in the chain of events that it doesn't involve actually understanding metabolism and therefore cleaning it up. It involves messing around with the initially inert side products of metabolism. And that makes it a lot easier. Um, now, that's actually only one of the three reasons why I think the engineering approach is the way to go. The second reason is going to be the subject of the next few minutes. And it's the concept of longevity escape velocity that I mentioned earlier. Now here I am depicting in an extremely formalized schematic way the aging process. And I'm talking about this thing called reserve. Now that's not a new concept. That's simply the same concept as damage that I mentioned earlier, but it's the reciprocal. In other words, as damage accumulates, so we have less and less reserve. You can think of the reserve as the amount of additional damage that we can afford to accumulate before pathology begins to, begins to happen. So we've got here, in a very schematized sort of way, what happens during life. We've got a lot of reserve at the beginning, and eventually we have very little, and we get down to one calling the frailty threshold, where pathology starts to emerge, and eventually we die. Supposing we develop an intervention that slows down the rate at which damage accumulates by, let's say, a factor of two, and we apply it to someone who's already in middle age, so starting here, then we might double the, um, the time before the, the frailty threshold is reached, and that's good. That means we're giving this person a bit of extra healthy life. After we reach the frailty threshold, things spin out of control in the manner I said earlier, and it becomes very hard, much harder, even to slow down the process. So for purposes of um, illustration, I'm presuming that this slope here is the same as it was when we weren't doing anything. The question is, can we do any better than this? And the big thing about the engineering approach is that it's not simply slowing down the rate at which damage accumulates, it's actually getting rid of damage that's already accumulated. So we can imagine a situation like this. Again here I'm talking about an intervention that half solves the problem. So the blue line down here slowed down the rate of accumulation of damage by a factor of two. Here I'm saying we invent a repair strategy that gets rid of half the damage. And in order to describe which half, I'm just saying there is, I'm just saying by definition there's an easy half and a hard half. The easy half is the half that the therapy works on, and the hard half is the half that the therapy doesn't work on. 
So we do this once, and then we can wait for a while. And of course, damage continues to accumulate at the rate that it normally accumulates, because remember, we're not interfering with metabolism itself here. And but then we can apply the therapy again and again. And you know, it's pretty good. It's not perfect because the stuff that the therapy doesn't work on is continuing to accumulate unabated. And so, of course, eventually, just the hard damage on its own is going to be enough to take the person over the frailty threshold. The whole concept here reaches diminishing returns. But it's still a lot better than if we were only slowing down the accumulation of subsequent damage. Now, that's pretty good. But again, it's not good enough. Now, if we were mice, that would be the end of my story, because the x-axis here would be on the scale of two or three years, and not a lot happens in technology in two or three years. But a great deal tends to happen in technology, including biomedical technology, in, let's say, 20 years. And the interval that I'm showing here between this first application of these therapies and the second one might be, let's say, 20 years. So if we bear that in mind, then what we can actually predict with reasonable confidence is that by the time we apply these therapies to these people the second time, they will not only be able to fix the types of damage that they could previously fix, they will also be able to fix, for purposes of illustration, half of the damage that they could not previously fix. So we get the brown line that we see here with a sort of more thorough rejuvenation, um, restoration of an earlier, younger biological age at the second application of the therapies. And I think you can probably see where this is going. Um, the long run is that the health of the person goes, um, gets better as time goes on. The amount of reserve they have increases rather than decreasing. And this is why I can talk about this concept of longevity escape velocity, of um, being good enough to live forever. In this, in this scenario, we never develop therapies that can actually repair all of the damage that is accumulating as a side effect of metabolism, but we approach that goal fast enough to keep the overall level of damage within the bounds that metabolism can cope with. And, um, I'm going to introduce these two, term, these two phrases now, these two terms that I like to use. The term robust human rejuvenation is, if you like, the first step of the graph I've been showing you. The addition of something in the region of 30 extra years of healthy life, and therefore also of, health, of total life, or perhaps more, to people who are already in middle age at the time that the treatment begins. That's my quantitative definition of where we have to get to for this sort of iterative buying time to get going. And what it results in is longevity escape velocity. Um, so my definition of that is here, the rate at which rejuvenation therapies need to improve following the achievement of robust human rejuvenation in order to outpace the accumulation of damage that those therapies cannot yet repair. Now, that's very, very abstract. And those of you who know a bit of biology may be thinking, well, yes, maybe in principle, but I don't really believe it's going to happen, not anytime soon anyway. Um, the first answer I have to that, again, is not yet biological per se, but it's a little bit more sophisticated in its abstract sense. I got together with an excellent programmer in New York, Chris Phoenix, um, about a year ago, and a paper that we have just recently had accepted for publication. Um, reports the results of a rather a reasonably sophisticated simulation of the process I've been talking about, the accumulation of damage, the translation of that damage into pathology and mortality, and the um, postponement of that process using interventions coming along at a particular schedule. And I won't go through the details of this because I've got so much else to talk about, but in summary, we had a lot of additional features of the aging process built into this simulation that are over and above the summary that I've given you in the graphs I showed. Um, for example, we have the concept of many different types of damage, any of which could independently kill us, which is certainly the way that aging really is, and therefore all of which have to be borne down upon to a certain rate. Uh, we break those down into, down into subtypes of damage that are additive. We have the concept of feedback, where the damage accelerates more damage. We have heterogeneity in the population. Uh, we have the concept of risk of external influences. And this is the simulation, which obviously I'm not going to try to describe to you today. Um, and by way of validating that it was a sensible simulation, we determined how well we could predict, we could fit existing 
real-world mortality data. This was from the USA in 1999. The yellow line is the standard way that such data are described, which is um, called the Gumpert's fit. Uh, the orange line is the actual data, and the green line is the simulation. As you can see, it fits the orange line rather better than the Gompertz fit does. Um, this is the rate at which damage accumulates, which is also intuitively realistic. You can see that there's more heterogeneity in the population at an older age than at a younger age. Damage is accumulating maybe twice as fast at old age as it is during uh, early adulthood. So this is all um, the sort of thing we would expect to see. And the result was that if we take a bunch of cohorts of people of various ages at the point where this therapy arrives, we can, or begins to arrive, where the first therapy arrives, we can predict, we can simulate what sort of trajectory their damage profile would actually um, show. And so the top line here is how much damage someone has if they were already 80 years old before the first therapies arrive. And, and it's a bit jagged at first because the therapies are arriving at an irregular intervals and you've got to have, as I say, you've got to have some intervention in all of the various types of damage in order to get progress. But eventually things start coming down. Of course, if you were younger, 70 or 60 or 50 and so on at that time, then um, you never get to, then your peak damage is pro progressively lower. Um, now what this means for how long you're going to live is, is described here. If you're 80, this is the bottom line. If you're 80 when the first therapies arrives, it's basically not good enough because you spend so long in a very frail state where your risk of death in each year is relatively high that basically by the time things could have recovered, you're going to be all dead anyway, just statistically. Um, but if you were only 10 years younger, 70 years old when the therapies arrive, then 10% of you may get through to the point where you have a negligible chance of dying of aging. And you can see, if, you look, if you can see the numbers, those of you in the back probably can't, the numbers on the x-axis here are um, basically 50 years old, 100 years old, 150, 200, 250. Essentially, however old you were when the therapies arrived, if you get through at all to the age of 250, you basically have no chance of dying of aging whatsoever, only of being hit by trucks and stuff like that. Um, and of course, depending on how old you were, your chance of actually getting to that age um, is, according to these simulations, these sort of numbers. So that's the whole concept. And of course, if I want to argue whether this is plausible, we can look at the progress of technology in other areas. I've just used powered flight here as an illustration. Um, you know, it took a very long time from the point where we decided flying would be fun to the point where we uh, worked out how to do it. But after that, you know, we made pretty unimaginable amounts of progress by a sequence of incremental advances and refinements um, in relatively short order. You know, I don't think the Wright brothers really had in mind the concept of flying across the Atlantic any time during the 20th century, and yet Lindbergh did it only 24 years after the Wright brothers. Uh, you know, passenger jetliners in 1949, only 22 years after Lindbergh, Concorde only 20 years after the comet. So this is the sort of rate of progress that we saw there, and of course, as we all know, a similar story can be seen in more or less any technology where public enthusiasm is present. So computers, of course, the um, combating, the combating of infectious diseases, you name it, it's there. Another thing I ought to point out is, some of you may be thinking, well, that's all very well. Um, you know, maybe we have to increase the rate, we have to double the efficacy of these therapies every 40 years or so, but supposing we just have a, a really bad century sometime in the future, you know, and we just happen to make no advances because we hit some nasty problems, then we're all screwed, aren't we? Um, but no, that's not true, because it turns out that the further we go in this process, the slower we can continue to go. Um, in this illustration, I'm just showing that the first therapies fix half the damage, the second one only fixes a third of the damage that the previous one couldn't fix. Um, 20 years later, only a quarter of the remaining damage and so on. And it still stays well above the frailty threshold. That sort of situation is probably quite well illustrated by looking at vintage cars, classic cars. This car obviously um, was built only to last maybe 10 or 15 years and it's actually more than 100 years old. And it's working every bit as well as when it was built. I mean, obviously it's old, but it's not really old, it's just old-fashioned. It's working just as well as when it rolled off the production line, except they didn't have production lines back then. Um, but yeah, I mean, so at, at this point, I mean, the key point is that the people who are maintaining these cars, they're doing an awful lot to them, but they're not doing any more to them than they were, let's say, 50 years ago, when the, when the car was only three times as old as it was ever supposed to be. So this is the sort of 
equivalent of essentially negligible escape velocity that we will be achieving in the fullness of time. All right, that's enough of longevity escape velocity because, as I say, most people who have an IT background tend to get that idea faster than I can even get the words out. Now I'm going to talk about how we're going to get those 30 years in the first place. Because, of course, when I talk about this phrase that you may have seen in the press, engineered negligible senescence, in other words, giving middle, initially middle-aged people unlimited extra healthy life, what I'm actually talking about, for the reasons I've described in the past 10 minutes, is giving them about 30 years of extra healthy life. And this is all I'm going to be able to tell you about the overall plan. I'm going to go into detail on just one component of this, but in very broad strokes, what I have been trying to argue over the past probably six or seven years now is that the damage that I spoke about and have defined in this abstract terms so far as the intermediates between metabolism and pathology, this damage in concrete biological terms can be classified into just seven major categories that I have here. Um, you know, things like cells dying and not being naturally replaced by the division of other cells. Um, indigestible molecules accumulating in the space between our cells, things like amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's disease. Um, Cross-linking, things like um, uh, m new molecular bonds forming between long-lived proteins in, for example, the artery wall. This is a major cause of high blood pressure in the elderly, and so on. And the key point is that we know in a fair amount of detail how to go about addressing all of these things. And when I say addressing, of course, I do not mean simply slowing down the accumulation of these types of damage, I mean going in and repairing these types of damage, or in a couple of cases actually, in the case of the mutations, um, making them harmless, obviating the damage rather than getting rid of it. Um, so I'm going to just talk about one of these things, number six down here, the elimination of indigestible molecules um, that accumulate inside cells. And I've chosen that one because, well, firstly because it's something that until I came along people thought was pretty much impossible, and I proposed a new approach to this that is gaining a great deal of attention and work is being done on it, so it's worth talking about, and also because it's glamorous. Um, now, first of all, why do indigestible molecules matter? Well, the answer is they are responsible for some of the nastiest and most prevalent diseases of old age, things like Alzheimer's and atherosclerosis. In Alzheimer's disease, and indeed in Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative diseases, you get this sort of thing happening. You get... Um, things that would normally go up and down the axon, the um, long part of the neuron between the cell body and the synapse, um, they stop being able to do this, a sort of traffic jam forms like this, with um, stuff that hasn't been digested properly and gets very much more elaborate and um, generally messed up, and things just stop traveling and the neuron isn't very happy, as you can imagine. Um, in real life, this is what it looks like. This is a dystrophic neurite with lots of junk lying around, things that are in the process of being broken down, but they're not being broken down. This is immunoelectron microscopy for a couple of enzymes that are supposed to be involved in breaking these things down and are simply failing to do so. And in atherosclerosis, the situation is rather the same. The course of atherosclerosis is absolutely lifelong. Even in children, you can see the early stages of it, what are called fatty streaks in the artery wall, um, essentially the accumulation of indigestible lipid molecules, such as um, oxidized derivatives of cholesterol. And this is the sort of thing that's supposed to happen in the artery wall. There are cells called macrophages that go in there and are supposed to metabolize cholesterol and um, derivatives of it, cholesterol esters, in a well-studied and well-understood pathway. And this pathway stops working, especially in this part of the cell called the lysosome. So you get this sort of thing going on. You get these lysosomes that are very large and completely full of lipid, and they've forgotten how to process it. And these cells accumulate, and eventually they essentially die, and you get an accumulation of these cells. That's the fatty streak, and atherosclerosis is on its way. So the question is, what can we do about it? And the idea I brought into the field was that we could use the technology from a strand of environmental decontamination, a strand called bioremediation, which um, owes itself to an insight from about 50 years ago that is called the microbial infallibility hypothesis, believe it or not. Um, the idea is that microbes have to have an ecological niche, and most microbes don't grow very fast. A microbe that can grow very fast can just get by by not being very intelligent and just by using the nutrients that any other bacterium could use, and it will outcompete them. 
But if you don't go very fast, then the alternative is only to eat something that your competitors can't eat. So if in an environment that there's a lot of competing bacteria, um, there happens to be an abundant source of organic material that's energy rich, but is for whatever reason difficult to break down, then that constitutes selective pressure for those bacteria to evolve the ability to break it down. And the one that can, that gets that um, property first or most effectively, has its ecological niche because it's the only bacterium that can break down this particular substance. So it turns out that if you go to, let's say, a disused airfield and you um, want to get rid of the TNT that's in the soil so that you can build houses on it, the way to do it is to actually get the um, get a sample of soil from the airfield and identify bacteria in it, and some of them will be able to break down TNT. The only reason there's any TNT there anymore is because there are not enough of those bacteria. And so you just grow them up in the lab, stick them back in the soil, and the TNT goes away. It really works. You can go to the side of the highway and you will always find bacteria that can eat rubber because there's pulverized rubber coming off tires all the time. It's completely extraordinary. And I realized that we might be able to use this technology in a uh, biomedical context um, if we looked at an environment that is enriched in human remains. Um, because, of course, the point of human remains is that they only consist of things that do not satisfy the criteria I just gave. Bones and teeth are not energy rich. And the things that I'm talking about, oxidized cholesterol, um, amyloid, things like that, do not accumulate in, in um, decomposed in decomposed human remains. So the chances are that they don't accumulate because there are indeed bacteria in the soil that are capable of breaking these things down. And the biomedical approach, of course, would not be to put these bacteria into the body. That would be a <laughs> bad idea. But rather to um, identify the genetic and enzymatic basis for that capacity and to put one or two genes into our cells, thereby enhancing our own ability to break things down and to, um, to thereby, get, thereby get rid of things that we are naturally unable to break down. So in, in, a, in a sense, what I'm saying is that there is a natural process in our bodies that turns young people into old people and eventually into dead people. And then there is a completely independent process that turns dead people into decomposed people, um, which, is in, which is encoded in the um, microbial ecology. So the idea is to do standard molecular biology to identify the genetic basis for that capacity and put that genetic basis, that ge those genes or enzymes, into our own cells. This is my extremely bad picture of a neuron. And, um, and that will be able to slow down the original process. Very straightforward, really. And people actually like this idea. Biologists are rather keen on it. It's a long and ambitious project. There's no question about that. We've got to find these bacteria, of course, which turns out to be the easy part. Um, You've got to identify the enzymes. That's boring, but it's got to be done. You know, it's standard molecular biology. We've got to make um, modifications of these enzymes so that they're expressed in mammalian cells in an appropriate way, and the enzymes actually go to the right part of the cell, the lysosome. Um, we have to make sure that they actually work in the mammalian cells. We have to make sure they're not toxic. We have to then do the same thing in mice and so on. So it's a long, long job. But if we could do it, then atherosclerosis and Alzheimer's and one or two other rather important diseases would no longer exist. So it's quite an ambitious but quite a high potential way to move forward. And the um, first step of that process, as I mentioned, is not, such, not so hard as all that. Here we have a very boring photograph of some bacteria. This is a phase contrast micrograph of a, a petri dish, an agar plate, with a few bunches of bacteria. Not very interesting. But on the next slide, I will show you the same field under the fluorescence microscope. This, as you can see, has the same clumps of bacteria, but it also has a whole bunch of other isolated bacteria that are fluorescing but not growing. And the experiment we did here was very simple. We just took some soil from, some, from a graveyard, indeed, and plated out the um, bacteria from it at very low density on this petri dish, and we gave them some what's called lipofusin to eat. This is one of the major things that accumulates indigestibly in the body. And we didn't give them anything else to eat. That was their only carbon source. So in other words, you've got a lot of these bacteria that are taking the stuff up. The stuff is fluorescent, which is why the bacteria light up. But having taken it up, the bacteria can't do anything with it. So they're just sitting there like lemons. Um, but a few bacteria do have the capacity to break down at least some of this substance. And they're having a great time. They've got ATP, so they can grow. This is how bioremediation experiments are done. And it works in this context too. And 
we are already funding in the Methuselah Foundation some work in um, Arizona State University in Phoenix and also at Rice University in Houston um, to identify more of these things. This is a particularly nasty oxidation derivative of, of cholesterol that accumulates in the artery wall. And we have already found bacteria that can break it down. You can even see, just by plating things out on a dish, how well they break it down. And you can see this is a pretty quick process. 10 days, and the stuff's more or less gone. So this is quite promising. You may, those of you who, who know a bit of biology, have thought of a few potential problems with this, and so have we. But we're not terribly worried about any of them. One is that the junk that accumulates in a variety of our cells is quite heterogeneous. So maybe we'd need rather a lot of these enzymes to break it all down. But actually, that may not be true, because the breakdown process for complicated molecules is a bit like taking apart a big complicated machine, like a car. You need the right tool at the right time, and that's more or less all. So if we add one tool to uh, the toolbox of the lysosome, the chances are that we will be able to um, give access um, to the right to the substrates to the enzymes that we already have, access that they didn't previously have. Um, we know this really by looking at the reverse situation, what happens if we take one enzyme away. Now, the lysosome has maybe 60 different enzymes in it to break things down, and it turns out that if you just take one of them away, it doesn't really matter which one, then stuff accumulates in the lysosome many, many times faster than normal. That doesn't make sense unless the process of breaking things down is a synergistic process in which the enzymes are cooperating in very much the way I've just described. Um, LSD is a lysosomal storage disorders. As I said, they're single gene absences of particular enzymes in the lysosome, and they tend to be fatal in childhood. Um, there are lots of problems to do with getting genes from bacteria to work in mammals in the first place, but some of them do, some of them don't. You may want to change the pH optimum of an enzyme, um, and that, uh, there are techniques to do that by essentially evolving the enzyme in the laboratory. Also, actually, fungi are useful, not necessarily bacteria, but fungi, because they have an acidic compartment already, like the lysosome, so that may be the way to go. And um, another problem is that people have said, well, okay, maybe you need a lot of this stuff in order to have selected for the, um, the enzymes in question, but we have to have a fair amount of this stuff in these cells in order for the cells to be suffering from them in the first place, so we're not too worried about that. How do we get these enzymes to the lysosomes of the cells that are affected? Well, gene therapy, either in vivo with viruses or ex vivo um, by taking cells and doing um, gene therapy in the laboratory followed by selection for the cells that have had the right modification. There are lots of ways to get um, enzymes to the right compartment. Here's a schematic of a few of them. There's something called chaperone-mediated autophagy, which is a process of active transport of proteins into the uh, acidic compartment. There's a vesicular approach. Actually, there are two vesicular approaches that involve fusion of one um, lipid-bounded um, sac with another that gets the stuff there. These are things that the body already does with our natural enzymes, and so it's just a matter of hijacking the same machinery, and the ways to do that hijacking are pretty well understood at this point. The other approach is to use what's called enzyme therapy, in which the genes are not introduced into the body at all, whether um, by gene therapy or by stem cell therapy, but rather the enzyme is manufactured in bacteria and the enzyme is simply injected into the bloodstream. And that seems pretty crude, but it works awfully well for lysosomal storage diseases. Um, this is the sort of thing you do. You mess around with the sugars that are attached to the proteins. Uh, for example, this particular enzyme, glucocerebrosidase, is deficient in one of the major um, lysosomal storage diseases, and it normally has this rather complicated set of sugars attached to it. If you knock a few of them off, these ones on the left, using a sequence of enzymes that are described here, and so you have something like this, then it gets targeted to the cell type, from the bloodstream, to the cell type that needs it, and people who would normally have died in early childhood are living in, the, in their thousands, I may say, a perfectly normal life as a result of this approach. So this is altogether practical. Safety is an interesting issue. Some people say, well, hang on, these proteins are foreign. They're going, any, any cell that, that expresses them is going to 
be destroyed immediately by the immune system. Turns out not to be true for lysosomal storage diseases, um, so we're not too worried, but also there are plenty of ways to address and to minimize the immune reaction to things. These are things that are being explored by lots of other routes. So again, this is not a showstopper. Some people are worried that these enzymes might break down things that we didn't want them to break down, as well as things we did. But again, just because an enzyme breaks down something unusual doesn't mean that it breaks down a wide range of things. Plus, there are lots of tricks you can play, like making the enzyme in an inactive form, which is only activated after it goes into the lysosome by the cleavage of the um, first chunk of the protein. This is, again, something that exists already in the body for some of our own enzymes. So the take-home message is, well, no one had considered that we could use the concept of bioremediation for biomedical purposes. I've got people uh, that we're funding now and that are submitting grants to the National Institutes of Health who never dreamt of ever setting foot in the National Institutes of Health, and they're very enthusiastic about it. And the enthusiasm is reciprocated by the biomedical people who have access to a completely new technology that they didn't know existed. It takes a few people working, I guess like me, working not in the laboratory, but as um, synthesizers, if you like, uh, bringing ideas together from disparate areas, um, because of course experimentalists don't have much time to read widely, experiments are too time consuming. It's a very radical approach, but it might work. Okay, so in my last five minutes or so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the foundation, what we do, and what we'd like to do. And I told you that we've got this seven-point plan. In other words, there are seven major categories of, of intervention that we need to develop, each of which will address one major category of accumulating damage in aging. Um, it may be that there is an alternative approach to postponing aging. We just don't know. Um, we think we know what to do. I think I know what to do. But, the, of course, the um, main point about being a scientist is that you have to accept that you might be wrong. So one thing that the foundation does is it runs something called the Methuselah Mouse Prize, or M Prize, which is not um, promoting any particular approach to life extension. It simply says, we'll give you some money if you can produce mice that live longer than any mouse has lived before. And the amount of money we give you depends on how much money we have at the time, and it also depends on how much you beat the previous record by. So it's a very simple concept. It has been very successful in raising the profile of life extension research without trivializing it. Um, we have $4.5 million in the pot. If you want to add some, you can just go to mprice.org and um, use a credit card. And, um, you know, it's definitely something that people are interested in. People are actually competing for this prize. So that's one way of going about it. Um, I also am the editor-in-chief of the, the, in, the Highest Impact Biogerontology Journal, um, Rejuvenation Research, which is the only journal explicitly focused on intervention rather than merely comprehension of aging. And again, what I'm doing with that journal is bringing together a range of biological and biomedical disciplines that do not see enough of each other. Um, it's rather the same concept as these conferences that I run that I mentioned earlier. But finally, and perhaps most importantly, we directly fund extramural research in the various strategies for engineered negligible senescence. Um, in other words, we are a straightforward grant-giving body. Uh, we're still very small, but not for long, with a bit of luck. The way we'd like to be is described here, our eventual organizational structure. We want to demonstrate the proof of concept that the sense approach can really work in mammals. And the way we'd like to do it is by taking a middle-aged mouse and trebling its remaining lifespan. Middle-aged mice are probably two years old if they come from a really healthy strain, and they have about a year to live. We'd like to change that one year into three years. In other words, get the mice out to their fifth birthday before they kill over. And we have, uh, in, in order to do that, we have to develop, I think, all of these various sub-goals, the sense strands, and within each of those strands, of course, to develop them for various tissues, which involve subtle differences in the methodologies. Um, that breaks down into two major tasks. First of all, it involves implementing the sub-goals individually, and that's fine so far. It's scientifically interesting. It's the sort of thing that will get people papers in science and nature and so on. So it is best done by academia. Um, and I reckon it's probably going to take something in the region of three or 400 full-time people for about 10 years. Um, the other part of the project is scientifically much less glamorous, rather tedious and certainly not very rewarded, which is to take things that work individually and put them together in the same mice and, and eliminate the interactions that you don't like that happen when you do so. 
that's best done in-house, and so we want a facility. We want to build something that I've been calling the Institute for Biomedical Gerontology, uh, which will be populated mainly by senior technicians rather than by professors, and will do the other half of the job, and I think we're looking at one or 200 people there. Um, this is where we are at the moment. As I say, we have about four and a half million dollars in the pot for the M prize. Um, we don't have any money in the research pot to speak of because we're spending it as fast as we can, and that's because it's the only rate limiting step. The academic interest in these various projects is, in, is extreme. I have been very successful over the past several years in not only getting to know the top people in the world working in these various disciplines, but also in discussing with them the approaches that I feel are being inadequately pursued and that could have rather a good bang for the buck. And there are professors all over the world who are extremely hot to trot to actually work on these things as and when they can get the funding to do so. A couple of the sense strands are now being funded directly by the Methuselah Foundation. They're only at a very minimal rate so far. Um, a couple of graduate students each. Um, lysosomal enhancement, which is the sort of thing that I mentioned a moment ago with bacterial genes to break down indigestible molecules, is happening, as I mentioned, at ASU and also at Rice. Um, in Cambridge in England, we are funding an approach to making mitochondrial mutations harmless, which essentially involves copying the mitochondrial DNA into the nuclear genome with suitable modification so that it still works. This is something that has been a concept for about 20 years, and we have succeeded in getting people sufficiently enthusiastic that they're actually working on it. A large part of the reason we're doing so is because we can pay them, and we can pay them because Peter Thiel, the, one of the founders of PayPal, gave us half a million dollars a few months ago, and that's what we've decided to spend it on. We feel it's the... Um, aspect of sense that has the best bang for the buck in terms of credibility. Peter did not only give us half a million dollars unconditionally, he also made a pledge to give us another three million dollars if it was matched by six million dollars from other people. And our next goal is to achieve that. What we'd like to do in terms of ramping up the um, Methuselah Foundation's effort um, is to move from what I'm describing here as level one, um, a couple of sense strands being supported very much at entry level, at this sort of um, level, because an average full-time scientist costs something in the region of $100,000 to $200,000 a year, if we include everything, salaries, of course, but also um, equipment and consumables and university overheads. So that's the sort of amount that we can do with that amount of money. Where we'd like to be, in other words, if the um, uh, TIL pledge is fully matched, is uh, level two, which is about an order of magnitude higher. We will be able to fund absolutely everything in sense except for the one area that really doesn't need our help, namely cell replacement. That's what stem cell therapy is for, of course, and um, stem cell therapy is really quite well funded, even despite the political difficulties that it has in this country. Um, so we're talking about that much. Now, when I say see handout for details, what I actually mean is see Jonas, who um, unfortunately didn't have immediate access to, access to a photocopier about five minutes before I stood up, um, so was not able to uh, give, give the handout. But it's just a, a one-page, double-sided description of 10 projects that we are in a position to fund so more or less immediately as soon as we get the money, and this is the sort of money we would need to be able to fund all of them. The question then is, what will we do after that? Level three is where we become what I think, what I think we, I'll be actually only two minutes. Um, level three is what I think we can call when we become a real funding agency. And that means when we start actually soliciting grant applications from scientists that I don't simply already know are ideal for this job. Um, and we need another order of magnitude higher money for that, simply because the process of processing grant applications and choosing really good ones has a lot of overhead to it. Um, so we're looking at this sort of amount of money, um, guaranteed for a bit longer so that, the, so, so that the grant giving process can be made sustainable. And finally, this is the stage that I was talking about a couple of slides ago, where we need to... Um, move to actually having a physical facility to integrate the various individual components of SANS in mice again. We're still only talking about mice um, in order to make it all work. The reason I focus so much on mice bears a little bit of consideration because, of course, there are considerable differences in the biology of mice versus humans, but the differences are small enough that it's pretty clear that both the scientists in question and also, for that matter, the general public and policymakers will feel that if we can make the sort of progress I described in mice, troubling the lifespan of mice that are already middle-aged before you start, then people will accept
accept that it's only a matter of time before we can do it with humans. And of course, that's not what people tend to accept these days. They tend to feel that aging is inevitable and always will be. Um, so that's really why we want to do all this. We feel that funding will not be an issue once this happens because people will vote for it. Um, but until we get these mice, it's a long haul in terms of public opinion. Um, so I thought I would just finish with these conclusions. Um, first of all, I've told you that a, a reasonable amount of thorough repair and obviation of ongoing molecular and cellular damage is foreseeable. There are these various types of damage that we need to fix. I think there are only seven major types of damage. Um, I think we are maybe only 10 years away from demonstrating the efficacy of these various techniques in mice. It will probably take at least another 15 years, could take a lot longer if we get unlucky, to translate that technology to humans. But even if we only have a 50-50 chance of doing it within 15 years from the point that we get the mice, that's certainly worth fighting for. Um, at the beginning of the talk, I explained that if we can buy a few decades of extra life for people who are already in middle age, then that will be functionally equivalent, with high probability, to buying time to live forever, because we will be able to continue to keep one step ahead of the problem, and indeed it will get progressively easier to do so. And finally, I wanted to point out the numbers involved here, in case some of you thought, well, there are other things that are also important to work on. I used to work in artificial intelligence before I found out how pathetically few people were working on trying to do anything about aging. But I thought to myself, well, first things first, really. There's not much point in having all these machines to do nice, boring things for you so that you can do creative stuff if you're already dead. So I decided to work on this first. And since we're talking about something in the region of two-thirds of all deaths worldwide being due to aging, and certainly about 90% of deaths in the industrialized world, we're talking about an awful lot of people. We are a long way away from getting these technologies to work, but we are not so far away that it's all serendipity. In other words, the sooner we start, the sooner we'll finish, and the more lives we will save. And I just wanted to end by a point with regard to optimism or pessimism about time frames. I've given you my estimate of the time frames. Other people may give you different estimates. It doesn't matter, because it doesn't matter whether it's your life. Maybe we can do this in time for you. Maybe we can do this in time for your mother or your daughter. And maybe not. But what I say is, so what? And I like to use an analogy here. As everyone in this room is perfectly well aware, there was an aeroplane that came down in a field in Pennsylvania in 2001 on 9-11, and it came down because the passengers overpowered the hijackers who had control of the plane. Now, we know that the passengers knew that they would save a lot of lives on the ground. We don't know much else, but we do know that they probably thought they didn't have much chance of saving their own lives. They also, of course, knew that they didn't know whose lives they were going to save on the ground. They just knew there were going to be an awful lot of them. And that's really why I work in this field. I don't know whether it's going to be in time for me or my wife or my mother, but I do know that if I can bring this forward even a little bit, I'll die happy. And I hope you think the same. I'll stop there. Well, thank you very much. Um, we will um, now have time for questions, and I will uh, hand out the microphone to save some time. Um, we have gotten heads up to actually um, go over the time a little bit, and it will continue to be recorded. So I think we have as much time as we need. All right. If you just call out the question, I'll repeat it, so you don't need to run. Cons of infinite lifespans for humans. So the question is pros and cons of infinite lifespans or even indefinite lifespans because, of course, we can still get hit by trucks. Um, I spend a lot of my time on this, and if you go to my website, you will find that the biggest page is a page uh, addressing exactly these questions. I get questions about this all the time, of course. I think that, well, in the interest of time, I will just give two big answers. One is that we're talking about saving lives here. There is no difference between saving lives and extending lives. And for that reason, we have to apply a sense of proportion to this question. There may indeed be a whole bunch of problems. In fact, I think we can go so far as to say that there will definitely be a whole bunch of problems that will be caused by the elimination of aging as a cause of death. Um, but 
that should not stop us from saving lives any more than it stopped our forebears 100 years ago from implementing um, hygiene and antibiotics and vaccines and so on when they discovered how many lives they could save. You know, if someone had got up and told Pasteur that he shouldn't actually be washing his hands when he was um, delivering babies and so on because overpopulation would happen, then, you know, we might be in a different world. So I think that's one answer. We have to have a sense of proportion. We have to realize that aging kills people. And furthermore, of course, that it kills people really horribly. There's an awful lot of suffering involved that we could save if we um, were able to fix this, because there just wouldn't be any frail people anymore. The other point I like to make here is a matter of choice. There may indeed be, in the fullness of time, the realization on the part of society when they have these technologies that there are downsides that are so bad that they want to go back to not actually curing aging at all, and they want to carry on living and dying the way that we do today. But the question is whether, sh whether we should be making the choice for them or whether they should be making it for themselves. And it seems pretty bleeding obvious to me that it's their choice, not ours. It's something that, you know, if we were saying, let's not go there, there will be too much overpopulation or dictators will live forever or we'll all get bored or whatever, then we will be imposing our values on our descendants. And we have no right to do that. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm very impressed with the engineering plans, but it seems that most of the hard problems of getting massive funding, uh, like societal-wide funding, seems to be delayed on, we'll wait until we have really nice mics. We can show people, and that'll convince them. And um, like, I understand that changing public opinion, affecting the course of popular fiction, affecting the dialogue is very, very difficult. But it, it doesn't seem that the foundation is doing enough in that regard. I mean, even hiring a graphics designer for some of the more public-facing things, like the Methuselah Mouse Foundation, a really messy website with really terrible t-shirts, and the data, that's the one that's most focused on people who don't understand science. So if you talk to maybe some about the public relations aspect. Yeah, so the question is um, about the public relations and the outreach aspect, that maybe the foundation, or at least I, am too focused at the moment on the idea that, well, all we have to do is get these mice um, and then every, everything, all the funding that is needed to translate the technology to humans will just emerge spontaneously. And getting the mice doesn't actually involve convincing too many billionaires to give us some money. So, you know, why bother too much with the PR? And I have a lot of sympathy with this, with, with this um, point of view. Um, one thing that the questioner mentioned was the fact that our websites are not particularly presentable, and we completely agree, and we are actually a good way through a complete revamp, which is being done by professional designers, so I hope that the results, which will be out within a few months, I hope, um, will be to the liking of everybody here. Um, in, other, in other terms, you know, I, I, again, I completely agree. I think the more we can do to, the more strategies we can follow simultaneously to enhance the outreach, the better. The problem at the moment is, you know, you have to do what you can with the personnel you have, and so there's only so much we can do. But certainly, I'm very sympathetic to what you say. Back. Um, with the uh, caveat that we know you're not prescribing drugs, what do you think, if anything, are the best supplements we can take? Resveratrol, alpha lipoic acid, epicatechins? What, what do you think? So the question is, what's available now that people can actually do to extend their own lives? And the answer is, bugger all. The, um, well, of course, that's not true for everybody. Some, some people have particular conditions that can be treated and restored to some, some, somewhere near normality by things that are available now. Um, Ray Kurzweil is famous for taking a large number of vitamins. Um, Ray came down with type 2 diabetes in his 30s, which most people don't. And I don't know how many of the 250 pills he takes a day are actually important to maintaining his freedom from diabetes, but the fact is he is completely free of diabetes. Um, but for most people who are congenitally healthy and are naturally going to live to 80 or 85, at this point, in my view, there is nothing that can extend that by more than a year or two at most, and probably not even that. Of course, there are plenty of ways you can shorten your life, but you knew all those ones, you know, don't, don't smoke, you know, get enough exercise, all the boring things. So therefore, the real answer to the question, how can you increase your chances of being healthy enough at the time that these therapies come along that you will make the cut, is since you can't put, increase your, decrease your rate of aging, you've got to bring the therapies forward. So in other words, give me a large amount of money and... and yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? I'm just wondering whether 
whether there's some chance that having a diversity of ages uh, within the human population. Sorry, speak up. I can't hear. I'm wondering whether having a diversity of ages uh, might reduce the, our chances of becoming extinct if something was to come along that happened to be very harmful to people in a particular age. Okay, so this is a question that comes up quite often. It's quite an important one. The question is, um, would, would, would our susceptibility to pandemics uh, be increased by the um, elimination of aging? And the, if one looks at the detail of this, the answer seems pretty categorically to be no. Um, if the death rate is being reduced to a very low level, then what that basically means is that our genetic diversity is staying static. Uh, furthermore, if a pandemic does come along, just as it could, could come along today, and it kills half of us, then of course um, that means we've got more room to, to reproduce in the normal way and restore more genetic diversity. Um, there is also the very important point that um, what we are doing with our current medical technologies and also what we will be doing with future genetic technologies, gene therapies, um, is to alter our course of evolution and indeed vastly accelerate it relative to historical rates um, by, our own, by our own hand. So it may be possible to actually artificially improve our genetic diversity and thus our resistance as a species to pandemics by the same sort of technologies that we will anyway need in order to defeat aging in the first place. Any more? I've worn you out. Thanks for coming. <laughs>